but this is the high school math edition. It's mostly going to focus on actually what happens with ZKPs and how they work. Um, so we have lots of identity. Identity is um, contextual. You want to use different things at different times depending on what you are trying to accomplish. If you're uh, driving badly and you need to show it, it's a driver's license talking to a police officer. If you're going across the border, you're using a passport, all sorts of things. Um, lots of these are government, but a lot of them are other, other things, universities, degrees, bank accounts. Um, membership in a club, all sorts of things. Uh, all of those are elements of identity. And so we've lived for 2,000, 2,500 years with paper credentials. Um, paper credentials um, have a model that you should recognize, but I want to call it out so you realize what, what we're talking about, which is an issuer gives you a piece of paper because of some reason, some relationship you, you have with that. The issuer is some sort of authority and they give you a piece of paper for some reason. You tuck it away in your wallet, perhaps, if it's useful in a mobile environment when you're running around in the world. You might put it in your filing cabinet um, for whatever reason. Sometime later, in an entirely separate transaction, a verifier says, show me those pieces of paper you have. And you bring out the piece of paper, and you show them. Um, proves. Uh, when you do that, and I put quotes around the word prove, um, who issued the credentials? It's going to have some sort of name or, or icon, logo on the piece of paper. Um, who holds the credential? It's going to have some sort of binding to you, that it's your credential and, you're, and, and it's you that is presenting it. Um, and that the claims are unchanged. They haven't been modified. You haven't forged the document. Um, the trust that they're trying to figure out is mainly with you and mainly they're concerned about are you forging these documents? Have you faked these for whatever reason? Um, that's a lot of what you're doing, but, but as well, there's, there's other sorts of trust. Um, there's the technology around it. it does, the, does, the, does the item you're presenting look legitimate? Does it look forged? Does it look like you would forge it? Often they'll ask for three pieces of, of information or four because there's no way you could forge four documents. That's going to be uh, all with the same name on them. <sighs> Never. Um, but they overcollect information to try to correlate them. And then they go off on their own systems and try to figure out, OK, did you present something valid, real? Um, and then the other side of it is the governance. What is the authority that issued the credential? Are they trustworthy? What processes do they have before they issue that credential to you? And so if it says government of British Columbia on it, that might carry some weight. Um, if it carries, um, we actually had a lot of experience with um, when we issued, uh, we worked with the Law Society of British Columbia to, um, for their issuance because people wanted to know, well, how, how does the government or the law society verify that the right person is getting the right credential, that they're actually a lawyer? What's their you know, login process? Can you get a, an account and fake an account and so on? So do they have trusted processes? Um, paper credentials are, are what we're using in the digital world right now. We scan them and we send them off. Um, this, is the uh, this is a screenshot that somebody gave, sent me the other day of Google's um, identity process for some sort of program they have where they ask you to take a selfie while you're holding your, your driver's license, your government ID. And good enough, it must be you because that looks like you in the picture. There's no way you could have faked that. Um, so what we're trying to do is introduce a world where there's verifiable credentials. So um, credentials that contain the same information, the same thing that paper ones are, but, but have some cryptography and some processes built in so that you can verify it. So uh, you've got the same model. You've got your issuer. You've got your verifier. You've got your holder. Um, we added an element that I'll talk about a bit later called a verifiable data registry. So that's adding one more component, and, and, and I'll talk about it. Um, the, the ceremonies, the transactions that occur are the same. An issuer gives to the holder. That's one transaction. The holder presents to verifiers. That is a separate transaction. And that's really important, that there's an issuance process. You get something. You get a digital document that's cryptographically signed. And then you share it with the verifier. Um, proves, I've removed the quotes around proves here. Um, who issued the credential? Um, who it was issued to, 
um, that it was issued to you and that you're the one presenting it, that there's a binding to you. Claims are unchanged. We've got cryptography for that. That's, that's helpful. Um, and the claims have not been revoked. That, that can be added if the issuer wants, if the issuer wants a mechanism to be able to revoke. Um, I put um, asterisk on the who holds the credential because verifiable credentials come in different flavors. The one I'm talking about today in OnCreds includes that binding between who the credential was issued to and is holding on to it and them presenting it. That's inherent in the credentials. Not all verifiable credential models have that built-in um, mechanism for binding. Um, still, still required is does the verifier trust the issuer? Um, the holder, they don't have to worry so much about this. It's virtually impossible to force these. We'll get into the math to show why it's virtually impossible to do that. Um, but the, the verifier still has to decide, oh, this was issued by you know, some school that I've never heard of. Do I trust that school? I, I may have to do research to figure that out. I can figure out who issued it, but I don't. But I have to figure out if I trust them. I wanted to highlight that um, this is different from the OpenID Connect model that you're familiar with, the login with Facebook. Um, this is different in that the triangle is the same. It looks the same there. We've got a holder, it's labeled user, and we've got a verifier labeled relying party. And it looks the same, but it's different in that um, when the user is using their phone and sharing their credentials, they're actually telling the issuer, hey, somebody wants to see my credentials, send them over. And, and the line, physical line at the bottom there, is the actual flow of data. So in a single transaction, all three of the parties um, participate, and the issuer knows every time you do it. So the big thing we're trying to do, and certainly from a government perspective of what um, um, government of British Columbia is trying to do, is separate out those so that when you use your credentials, the issuer doesn't know you're doing it. And this is an important privacy and tracking feature that we're trying to eliminate. We want um, the verifier to be able to um, do operate in a digital economy without the tracking of the issuer along to figure out what they're doing and how they're doing it. That makes sense? Okay. Um, a non-creds is, a, is, as I said, a flavor of verifiable credentials. It contains a couple of features beyond generic um, W3C um, uh, standard that, that go beyond it. So those things are selective disclosure. So when you present a credential, you get issued it with a bunch of data. When you present it, you can only show some of it. You can selectively disclose which attributes of the credential you want to show. Um, a thing called predicate proofs. This is what we're going to talk about even more. Um, all of this is based on zero knowledge proofs, but this is the most obvious that it's a zero knowledge proof, which is I prove that I am older than a certain age, I'm older than 19, based on the date of birth that's in the credential without exposing the date of birth. So again, I get the check mark. Um, derived presentations. So I'm not sharing the credential actually when I use the non creds. I'm not actually getting a credential and then showing it to the verifier. I'm actually deriving a new credential that I'm generating on the fly and then sharing it with the, um, with the verifier. With that, I'm getting unlinkable uh, identifiers. So a, a, a credential, a cryptographic credential with signatures, has a whole bunch of uniquely unique data correlatable to you, to your credential. With this, um, all of those are blinded such that you get unlinkable identifiers. You may share something that's unique about you. You may share your driver's license number, um, but you don't have to, you don't expose correlatable identifiers just by the act of, of presenting something. And then the last is multi-credential presentations. This is a, a big deal, which is um, you can share, for example, our example in uh, the Law Society of uh, that I am a lawyer and this is my government identity, my name from the government perspective. And I can share those two things in a single transaction and prove that they were both delivered to me to the same wallet, to the same identity, same, uh, same individual, okay? Uh, last thing I want to touch on before I get into the math is verifiable data registry. So this is how the verifier doesn't call home to the issuer every time they verify. And that is that the before issuing a credential, the issuer publishes to some public place the key 
necessary or keys necessary to verify the presentation. So instead of the verifier getting the data and then calling the issuer to say, hey, can you tell me the public key so I can verify this data? It goes to some neutral place, often a blockchain. It can be a ledger, can be a blockchain, but can be anything, can be a database, can be you know, via an API, can be to DNS, can be to a web server. Wherever, as long as it's public such that the verifier can get to it. Make sense? All right, um, Hyperledger non-creds, just a quick pitch, is a project of the Hyperledger Foundation. Um, there's a complete open source implementation plus a specification. Um, it's been used for seven plus years. We've been using it and working on it um, for over seven years. And then before that was a project called IDMix uh, from IBM. Um, the big change in moving it to a project and outside of where it's been is that it's ledger agnostic, meaning that part about where you store the key, um, that can be anywhere. And that's what's expanded about this. We've, we've removed a dependency on a particular implementation, Hyperledger Indy, and made it, um, and made it um, generic. And um, by the way, um, with a, a single key stored on a ledger, you can issue a billion credentials. Uh, I do want to make it clear that um, when a credential is shared, it's peer-to-peer. -peer. Nothing goes on the ledger or wherever at the time you issue it, and nothing about the credential goes on the ledger. Okay. Um, the one um, other thing is uh, the issuer may revoke the credential, again, by publishing to a ledger. But that is not about the individual, so there's nothing that is put on a, on a public place about individual data for uh, a particular credential. Cool? Okay. Why is it important? Um, I put this in, hopefully, if you want to take a look at the slides. I did want to get these key points in. Um, the big thing is um, we spend a ton, governments, I mean, spend a ton on physical identity cards and programs related to that. Um, we, uh, and, and, and sending out paper credentials, passports and driver's license and have fancy technologies to make sure you can't forge them or, and so on. That same, uh, that same um, idea is needed for digital credentials. And, and so we want to um, build up that capability. And, and we think um, verifiable digital trust is extremely important. And uh, verifiable credentials is a great model to do it. We think it's, it will be the model. Um, OK. Now we switch. Now we're into the math. OK, this is the fun part. High school edition, though. I'm not, we're not getting into college here. Um, what is a zero knowledge proof? Um, I've already talked about this. A method by which a, a prover can prove to another party that they know a value of x, but without sharing x. So they know the value, but they don't want to share it. So the value is in the credential. And they want to prove something about it, but without sharing the, the, the value itself. Um, core of a non-creds, the classic examples, but actually it, you, a non-creds uses it in a whole bunch of places. So uh, holder, the holder knows some piece of information, um, wants to prove it to the verifier, but without exposing any other information. The verifier doesn't know X, um, wants to know that the prover knows it, but doesn't want to know the actual value. So let's start with Waldo. How do I prove that I know where Waldo is without telling you where Waldo is? You know how to do this? Take a big piece of paper that's at least four times the size of the Waldo picture. You move the Waldo picture around such that in the little hole you can see Waldo. And now I can prove I know where Waldo is, but you have gained no knowledge of where Waldo actually is. I then Remove it, show you the picture again. You don't know anything. You haven't gained any knowledge. That's a zero knowledge proof. We haven't even got to high school. This is the nursery school edition. OK, so I start with this picture. Do you know, who, well, first, do we know who Waldo is? Are you familiar? OK, we're familiar with who Waldo is. So somewhere in that picture, Waldo exists. I want to prove to you I know where Waldo is, but I don't want you to know, because you'll just show off and show other people. So what I do is I take a big piece of paper, and then I don't move the paper over Waldo. I move the picture of Waldo around so that he's um, in the little box. 
And then I've proven to you, because you can see, oh, yep, that's Waldo. But when I move it around and take it back, you still have no idea where he is. You didn't gain any knowledge. You know that I know, but you didn't gain any knowledge. Cool? Nursery school edition of. So attributes, um, probable, uh, the, um, the proof is actually uh, probabilist, probabilistic. It's not deterministic. So you're actually proving it's very likely. And where likely is, you'll see what I mean by likely. Um, there's a level of randomness in it so that um, I'm uh, essentially, as the prover, stuffing some other information, random information, that, that is what prevents you from figuring out what the actual value is, but it used enough to prove that I know it. And there's two different forms, basically interactive and non-interactive. And so we're going to talk about interactive and, and non-interactive proofs. Um, three requirements we're trying to get to, completeness, soundness, and zero knowledge. Completeness means if the statement is true, the prover can be confident it is true. If the statement is false, soundness, if the statement is false, nothing the prover can do can make it true. So if you have a date of birth and you're under, you know, you're under 19 and you're trying to prove you're over 19, you will not be able to do it. So soundness. And then the last is zero knowledge, that no additional knowledge is shared in, in, the, in the zero knowledge proof. Okay? So we're going to go four things we're going to cover. Functions and inverse functions. We're going to cover exponents, modulo operator, and prime numbers. So this is your warm-up course um, for the part where we get to the zero-knowledge proof. So a function. Given a value um, x, I, have, uh, I, I transform it in some mechanical way. And so it's basically a machine where I put an input in and I get a transformed output out. Um, first one there, x plus 2. So if I put 25 in, I get 27 out. Easy enough? functions. We remember that, right? Inverse functions. This is where you did the manipulations to reverse it. You took the x plus 2, you moved it over to the y side, you swapped it around, you had to make sure they always stayed equal. You remember that? So an inverse function is where you are reversing the function you started with. So that when you take the result of the function, you got back the original value. Okay? That's what we don't want. For ZKPs, we want exactly none of those. <laughs> we want a function which has no useful, uh, is impossible to invert. You can't take the output and come back to what the, uh, what the original value was. Okay? Function, inverse function. Good? Okay. Exponents. Remember these? 2 to the third. 2 times 2 times 2. Easy. You remember those, x to the 5, 5x's. Five um, there's a couple of laws of exponents, and this is actually where you're going to see the magic happen, is in these. Uh, x to the 0 equals 1, right? Remember that one? x to the 1 equals x. You just knock it off, x to the 1. Um, xa times xb is x to the a plus b. And then the last one, xa to the b, is xa times b. So we're going to use these in a bit. So you might come back to this when you're looking at the slides after and seeing it. Modulo. Do you remember modulo? That's pretty easy, right? Modulo is simply the remainder when you do a division. So if I, in this case, um, divide, take 321, and I modulo 17, I divide 321 by 17, and I ignore what the result is, and I take the leftover, which is, in this case, 15. Modulo. Good. Um, for some reason that I don't quite get, but it's common to use a clock for this analogy for modulo, so I don't know. I left it in the slides just because it was OK. Exactly, and then you knock the 12 off and it's modulo. There you go, modulo 12. All right, good. Um, I think this was the last one, prime numbers. We all know those, divisible by one and itself and nothing else. And so there's a long stream of them, a very long stream of them. 
infinite number of them, in fact. Okay, so no math. We're going to talk about Alibaba's cave. How many, uh, I don't care how many of you have heard of Alibaba's cave. We're still going to go into it. Um, this is an interactive um, zero knowledge proof based on probability. So Bob, we've got to have Bob and Alice, right? Because it's a, it's a, it's a credentials thing. You always have Bob and Alice. So Bob's a verifier. Alice is a prover. We've got Alibaba's cave, and it's got a magic door in it. And the magic door has a code on it. Alice knows the code, or she claims to know the code. And what the code allows her to do is go through the door. So what um, Bob is going to do is going to ask Alice to go into the cave without telling him which, um, which path, A or B, that Alice is going to take. And then Bob will say, Alice goes in, she went in the A side. Bob will say, come out the A side. And Alice will go, oh, thank goodness, I went in the A side, so I can come out and I can prove I know it. I know the code. Well, that's not going to convince me. You do it once, you're not going to convince. You've got a 50-50 chance, right? So now you do it again. Alice goes back in again. She picks the same one, but Bob says, come out B. Now, if, Bob, if, if Alice doesn't know the code, eh, she's, she's sunk. Done. After two iterations, she's done. But if she knows the code and she went in A, she can still come out B because she can go through the wall and come out B. So now two iterations have been done, and Bob's going, well, it seems like she might know that. Let's do this 100, well, 20 times. Let's do it 20 times. And if Alice is every time able to do this, where she randomly goes in and picks one side or the other, and Bob tells her to come out one side or the other, Bob can be pretty sure that Alice knows the code, that she couldn't have guessed every time which is the right one. Um, so there's the rounds. Obviously, any time, you know, th this talks about what, what Alice chooses, what Bob chooses. If you do this n times, you're going to be pretty confident. And the first time um, Bob picks one and Alice went the other way, it's immediately obvious to Bob that Alice doesn't know the code. So it turns out, um, uh, I thought it was on that slide, but anyway. Um, completeness, if Alice honestly knows the secret code, um, Bob will eventually be convinced. They'll have done it enough times that she's, he's convinced. If Alex, Alice doesn't know the code, it's going to be very obvious pretty soon. Uh, she's not going to guess every time which way Bob's going to want her to come out, so it's not going to work. And, and Bob doesn't learn the secret code. He doesn't know it. Alice still knows it, but that's it. So let's do it without the math. Um, we need a one-way function. So this is, this is where we get into the how to, how to do this with, with functions. So the function we're using is g to the x mod p. Okay, And that's actually a common function, I think used in lots of other things, but this is the thing. Um, g and p are public and known values. So both Bob and Alice, in this case, know um, G and P. X is the thing that Alice knows that Bob doesn't know. Okay, So that's our function that we're going to use. Hopefully, we all remember our, the math we just went through. Um, it is virtually impossible to go backwards to find X with that, um, with that uh, formula, with that function. So the summary of the steps, um, Bob and Alice agree on G and P. They share that. Eh, good enough. Alice knows x, and she tells Bob f of x. She does the math to come up with f of x. Um, as we said, can't be reversed, so <clears throat> that doesn't help Bob. Bob doesn't know uh, no x from that. Alice generates a random number r that she keeps to herself. Whoops. Um, calculates f of r and tells that to Bob. Okay, so now Alice knows f of x and f of r. Um, then Bob randomly sends Alice a, 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 a number c that is either a 0 or a 1. Now, this is where we come into those exponential things that work. Alice defines a new variable v, which is r plus x times c. So she takes the r that she knows, she takes the x that she knows, and she takes the c that Bob gave her, 
And then she does the, again, runs the function, runs v through that function, shares it with Bob. Bob is able to check, knows f of r, Alice told her, told him, uh, knows f of x, knows c, because he made it up, and then also knows f of v, and so he does the math to figure out, do those all line up? And if that is, then Alice passes. Woohoo! Alice knows it for one iteration. So here is the math that if we go back to our, you know, exponents piece. Um, so that's the formula checked by Bob. So if we expand out f of r and f of x, we get our original gr mod p, gx mod p to the c, which by going back to our exponent, uh, exponents, g, which is g to the r plus x times c, we've just altered the way we've calculated it. And by doing that, we see that g to the r plus x times c is the same as what Alice calculated. And so without knowing x, without knowing r, Bob is able to determine, yep, she knew it. So um, this is a list of the variables involved. x is, say, 4, nice small number. Uh, g is 5. Uh, p, our modulo, is going to be a prime number. Uh, it, uh, g can be any constant. Um, p has to be a prime number, so we want to use that. So we're going to use 17. Then we just do the f of x calculations. So g to the x, which is 5 to the 4th. Modulo p is 13. Um, r is the random number that Alice collected, chose. Same thing again, we do the same calculation. And then Bob sends either a zero or a one over, random choice. So there, there's our randomness coming into this. So we've got our randomness and our probabilistic is coming into it. And then the result of V depends on what C is. The, ma the um, case one, if C is zero, um, you'll see that Alice sends Bob V of F, which is 10, and the calculation is done. Bob's able to do the calculation and it matches. If um, the case two, C equals one, is done, the, the math also matches. So again, homework. You can take this back and verify for yourself that this all works. So that was the quick part. That is the core of it right there. That's how you do it. Cool? It's kind of fun. Um, Alice knows X, she can always give, oh, and, and by the way, uh, oh, yeah, Alex knows X, she can always give the right response. Alice doesn't know X, she has a probability one half of giving the correct value. So correct only if Bob sends a C equals zero, for example. Um, so doing it once doesn't really get us there. That probability part isn't there. We do it 20 times, and Alice has a one in a million shot. So we start again. X stays the same, but R becomes different. C becomes different. And so we do the calculation over and over. And so back and forth, Alice and Bob are going 20 times. And after 20 times, it's, the probability is one in a million that Alice has been guessing what Bob would do every time and sending the right value. OK? Now, imagine we're trying to do a zero-knowledge proof in in you know, daily life, and Bob and Alice have to go back 20 times. Think of the API you would use, back and forth 20 times to figure it out. So interactive, yeah, it's not going to cut it. So this gets a little more complicated of generalizing it. Um, so first of all, instead of choosing C between 0 and 1, just doing it every time, um, C is between 0 and P minus 1. Remember, P minus 1 is our um, prime number for our modulo. So in our case, we chose 17. So C is now going to be between 0 and 16 in those. And every uh, uh, Professor Saka is a Japanese professor who actually I stole lots of this from and enjoyed listening to. Uh, well, she presented it. She did a really good job. Um, that represents a, each bit in C is an instance of a 0 and 1 iteration. So this, and, and think back to this when I show you what P looks like of how many bits 
of information are in P when you see it. Um, I'll be showing that in a bit. But um, it reduces the number of iterations necessary. If I've got 20 bits in there, I only need to do one iteration, and I can be pretty co confident that that's going to be known. But even one intera intera uh, interaction is, is too many. We want to get it down to Bob sends a request, Alice sends a response, and that's it. We want to get down to just one back and forth. Um, so this is what makes it non-interactive. It's a little bit tricky. Um, Bob specifies a hash function h and a random number i. So the random number is the new thing that gets introduced that Bob asks. So instead of asking for c halfway through the process, up front, she, uh, he asks for uh, this function uh, h of f, h, and i. i is um, used to prevent replay attacks. So a familiar thing in, in doing cryptography is you, you put some variation into every interaction you do so that nobody can listen in, hear a, uh, hear a response, and then, and then reply with the same one, replay what, what worked before. So I makes it every, every presentation unique. Um, so that, that's how we get there. Um, in real life, um, X doesn't have to be a number to start out. So one of the things is, ultimately in a zero-knowledge proof, always X is a number. But X could be a string that you t hash into a number. And now you use that number as part of the zero-knowledge proof. It constrains what you can do with it. So for example, you can't prove your date of birth if it's in a string. Um, as a predicate, but as long as it starts out as a number, you can do predicates on it and things like that. But you can always do things like selective disclosure, not revealing um, some of the value, well, uh, some of the attributes while still proving the entire credential, proving all of the attributes so that you have them all, but without revealing some of them. So um, you can use that. Um, then numbers G, P, and C are really, really big. So that's what P looks like in an, an OnCred's presentation. It's a very large number. And remember I said C represents the number of bits. That's a lot more than 20 bits. So you get the probability is a lot less than one in a million um, that you've got it, which is, of course, the whole point. So the proof is, even though it's probabilistic, the chance of, of fooling it is pretty low. That's what G looks like. So P is the random number. C is one le is arranged from zero to one less than that, and then uh, G. So zkps in an oncreds um, binding an identifier of the holder. So this is where um, you can put an identifier for the holder. The holder can share and prove that they know how it was how that credential was bound to them. They know the secret that's in there, but they do it without sharing that binding identifier. So that there's not a, an identifier uniquely identifying the person. Normally, in, in non-zero knowledge proof um, credentials, you would put a, an identifier that the um, owner of it can prove they have control over. Some, uh, you, know, you might put a, private key, or a public key in there and then get the, the verifier to prove they know the, the, public, or the private version of that. Um, that does, that's a unique identifier. We don't want that, so, th so we use um, blinding for doing that. Uh, we can blind all of the data values for selective disclosure in a similar way. Um, predicates and revocation, I didn't go into the details of how that gets done, but you can take a look at that and, and go into that. Bunch of references here in case you want to look it up. Um, glad to have, uh, you know, People can read these. Uh, these are tend to be more accessible than the academic papers. Um, CL signatures, academic paper, that is the non-high school math edition. It's ugly. Oh. But um, it's there. You've got a link there. But you've got other ones here that are, are more accessible. Um, CKPs in, in, in real life, why do they matter? Um, no shared new identifier. This is, this is big for government. Um, if you think about a national identity number, uh, SSN in the United States, uh, an SIN in Canada, um, that, that's legislation. There's big, uh, you know, it, it requires rules to be established by um, elected bodies to put these things into place. If we have to 
introduce new ones to put all sorts of new identifiers in for all sorts of individuals and organizations, that's a bit of a problem. And so we don't want to do that if we can avoid it, so it allows that. Also gets us to that non-correlation, that unlinkability. A verifier receives um, proof of a credential, a second verifier receives another, and they can't correlate the identity across them. Crucial. Um, so you've got um, unlinkability from the issuer, but you also have it across all the verifiers. That's really important. Um, the, the techniques you've seen of selective disclosure and predicates for minimizing the amount of data you're sharing. So you can prove something with whatever is necessary. So walking into a bar, you do not need to disclose the color of your eyes to get a drink in a bar. <laughs> it's just not needed. And yet we do it every, every time. Well, I don't, but um, you, we, that's what we're doing is showing all, and, and more importantly, showing the address we live and all that stuff. That is n uh, totally unnecessary. And, and so we want to minimize that. Often it's done not because it's needed for the transaction, but it's needed for the verification that the person has to go to offline to figure out who you are and whether you really are who you say you are and all sorts of other checking that you're gonna to do to figure it out. By getting the data from a, a, a trusted source, from a verifiable source, um, we're able to, to collect less data. We only need to collect what's necessary for the actual transaction. And then a lot of it is fighting back against online tracking. We really would like to take a, you know, a dent in that, which is, again, coming back to this unlinkability. Uh, we don't want to have, the, in the case of you know, the government, tracking every bar you go into and every time you buy cannabis and, and so on and so forth. There are all sorts of reasons for not doing it, but that's a super good one. Is we don't have it when we use a paper credential. We want to be able to operate online digitally, but we want the same privacy and protections we have when we're using a piece of paper. Um, talked about these things. Duplicate slide, nice. Uh, mentioned predicates uses bullet proofs, um, and revocation uses accumulators. So for those in know some cryptography, that's the techniques that are being used. I wanted to highlight this one. This is uh, 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 one of our participants in the Hyperledger community. Um, they are doing a decentralized finance DeFi application where they are actually putting a verifier into a smart contract. So the verifier that I talked about um, would use that. Um, basically, when doing an on-chain transaction, um, the the user who is trying to execute the transaction might provide KYC information via zero-knowledge proof based on a credential they were issued. So who issued it and so on, and whatever minimum data is necessary to be collected could be collected as smart of the, part of the smart contract, which could be just enough to say, oh, I'm a citizen of Canada. That might be enough. Um, and then, um, then they can proceed with an an on-chain transaction. So super interesting, got links in there um, to the company, their product, and then a video. And they, they just had a hackathon this past week that was evidently super interesting and, and leading to that. Um, everywhere paper credentials are used, this is a possibility for, for replacing them. And I think this is, this is why I think, uh, you know, it's inevitable that this will happen. This will be the way we'll be doing it in the future. It's, it's the question of how we get there, how soon, and how, um, how accessible it is to everyone, and, and, and we make it work for, for the vast majority. But there's lots and lots of use cases. Um, so call out, join Hyperledger and OnCreds. Um, you can deploy your own agents using Ares, Hyperledger Ares. Um, you can get a wallet, um, like John mentioned in the keynote from the government of British Columbia, you can download from two of the app stores, but there's a bunch of other ones as well, so you can give it a try um, and then see how it fits into your own project. I forgot to, and I'm bad at this social media stuff. Um, I'm doing a workshop on May 31st, so if you want to get into details of how actually Hyperledger can be used and actually play around with credentials and use them, uh, I am doing a, a, a workshop with Hyperledger that's uh, remote on the 31st of May, so coming up soon. There we go. Thank you. Thanks for attending.
Any questions? I didn't leave a whole lot of time, but I got through all my slides, so. Yes. Good. Uh, thanks. Um, so, so my, uh, so I mean, yeah, I follow politics and so on. And my, my, I, I'm very excited about the proposition of not of select selective dis 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 disclosure. That's yeah. the, the biggest advantage of this, I find. Yeah. Um, and, but I'm also uh, weary of, uh, like, uh, like, like, uh, really a government institution being able to truly allow for a decentralized, uh, you know, like I, I'm surprised and I'm an amazed and perhaps happy that you guys are leading the charge as part of the government, but I, but I want to, so my, my sort of my concerns around this, this thing uh, that I want to, but I feel like you're already addressing, but I want, I want to confirm it, yeah. is things around unlinkability and tracking. So I'm very uh, personally like, uh, my concerns are surveillance, yeah. of course, tracking all the movements and yeah. like, you can't do that with paper ID, but you can certainly do that with digital ID, your phones, uh, whether it's on device yeah. stuff in the mobile app that the government designs, if it's not on the ledger itself. Um, and uh, also the idea of like a revocation. So you can just sort of, immediately like you know like, like with the truckers just yeah. bank accounts gone id's gone now you're just like stranded on like in the middle of yeah. the road yeah so i'm wondering with unlikability is that part of this solution as so, part of the government's uh, plan so yeah. yeah so a couple of things there um nothing personal or anything else goes on a ledger nothing so the only thing that goes on a ledger is something an issuer wants to broadcast to the world so that you don't have to go to the issuer to get it so that's one um the wallet is a concern, and that's why BC is open by default. <laughs> uh, the way we can do that is have the wallet be open source code, um, auditable, verified by others. They can see what's in there and how it gets deployed, how it gets used, what happens within it. Um, the correlatability, the surveillance, 100%, it is that breaking up of the transaction of the issuance to the holder and the holder using it with a verifier. We want that separation. So we're, we're really passionate about that need to separate those things out so that there isn't that ability to do that surveillance. Um, really reduce it. Uh, as you say, like cell phones, uh, you know, location tracking, we're not addressing that. Um, what we're trying to do is if you use um, a, a, a credential, and in our, in our case, we're worried about a government issued one, we want to have that, um, that separation, that non-traceability, trackability. And so we try to do it both. Um, the issuer doesn't know where you've used it, and then verifiers can't correlate you across others. With the caveat that if the information you share makes you correlatable. So we're, we just make sure that just by presenting data, there's nothing correlatable in there, that every presentation is completely unique and useless to try to uh, consolidate across. So I have a follow up to that. Those are awesome uh, uh, pieces of information to get. Um, on, the, on the side of the, the app, so, so for example, one, one, one uh, way around this, the surveillance thing, assuming that for some reason you can't trust the open source code of the wallet, is uh, being able to access that, uh, that information throughout, like without downloading the app, without you know, through some kind of interface that you can just, yeah. like, the meta, the the the, metaverse, the the blockchain that's out there, you yeah. will be able to access in your own, you know, personalized. Let's say like I create like my Xcode app, and that's my wallet, or everyone else like you know, does it through a yeah. web app in web, yeah. web assembly or something. Is that possible? And the other thing is that on the the host uh, issuer, so the issuer verifier, yeah. the host verifier side, is well, what about the host? Like what? Like is this a, I know you said like no personally identifiable information is there, but like do they track? I calls to them or whatever. It's like, you know, there's yeah. easy ways to say, yeah. hey, yeah. and uh, this bar, these IDs are being queried. So yeah. some, someone could be like, just like, like traffic, monitoring traffic, of, uh, like Wireshark. Yep. Mm -hmm. So the answers to that is, is basically um, open source can be done anything. So yes, you can build your own wallet. You could host it. Now, the inter or, you, or you could then use it. The interesting thing there is, um, as a government, do we want to trust a wallet that is randomly showing up? So we expect that the way that will be done is, for now, we're only issuing to the BC wallet, not because we track with it, but because we know what's in it. We've done the analysis of what's in the code. 
if you bring a random wallet in that somebody gave you, it could be tracking you. Hey, you just made a phone call from a, a police station. Would you like me to get a lawyer for you? You just used your, you know, we don't want that kind of, um, uh, of use of it. So what we expect is there will be other wallets that others will be able to do it, but they will have to be compliant with and, and prove that they can be in the same trusted way. So that's, that's more or less that one. Um, Issuer. The host issuer verifier, I mean, the whole point of, of um, the verifier can always monitor who, what they're doing. We're trying to make it so that they can't correlate across presentations. Um, what other things they can collect or what other things they collect today, um, less control over that. I don't, I don't mean that. the verifier, I mean, I mean the other side. So, like, yeah, the host can't. The host can't. The, but, 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 the, Sorry, the so issuer. What, what is the host? Like, I'm, I'm, I'm curious, actually, because I feel like I... Again, I'm, I'm not a math person. I'm, I, yeah. I, I'm more of an application engineer, so I yeah. use all these things and I never understand them. Sorry, what host do you mean? Uh, so the host, basically, the where the information is stored for the verifier to connect to instead of the issuer. But that's the host? The device is the host? Right um, now, and what we're doing, it's all right there. It's all offline? Yeah. It's all peer-to-peer -peer with your device and that. This is our way of say, allowing you to have a server that holds your own data. <laughs> okay, so, so, the host, so when, when, the, when, the, when the verifier in front of you is uh, talking to the host. They're, they're talking device. to your machine. Got it, got it. Yes, got it. yes. You've got a peer-to-peer -peer conversation going on. Another part, you know, I mentioned Aries. Another part of it is it actually uses um, other, other cryptographic techniques to establish a secure end-to-end -end, um, encrypted session between you and it, you and the other the, the verifier. So if you so there's the ability to establish a, a relationship between you and say the government or you and your bank. One of the interesting uses of that I'll just throw out another little tidbit that might interest you. But um, that having that trusted peer to peer relationship, kind of like signal between you and your bank, is you know those SMS you get and and email you get from your bank that say, hey, you need to log in and do something, or, you know, nobody trusts those anymore, right? Throw them away. Email's not trusted. SMS is not trusted. You really need to know and think, and you get trained not to respond. Well, if you actually could use the BC wallet to send messages, the verifier, um, after they've established a relationship with you, could send you messages via that secure encrypted channel, you might be able to trust them again. Organizations have huge value in being able to say, hey, we can actually have a channel that we can use that our customers could, could trust. It's a big deal. I'll, I'll pass the Mac on. <laughs> one last thing, which is the, the, the authority, like uh, establishing authority for issuers. Yes. Um, do you imagine that to be eventually the government? Uh, no. Um, it, so that will be sort of domain oriented. There will be all sorts of, you know, uh, you get a, a degree from a university in a certain country. Their authority is the organizations of college and, you know, colleges and universities within that. Um, mining community has the London um, Metals Exchange as a, Wait, so I mean, all sorts like of places. Key, like the public key cryptography Oh, stuff? those are where, where people choose to do them. Some of the, you know, right now, Microsoft offers a service that allows you to put, root them in Bitcoin. Um, they can be Ethereum, there's Ethereum based. Um, we're using a ledger that is, um, operated by a set of known parties, so it's a, what's called a permissioned ledger. Everyone can read from it, but only certain people can write to it, and so it's permissioned in that way. But a Bitcoin-based one, anyone could, could write to that. Time. Okay, let's get out of here. <laughs>